Good morning, everyone. How are you guys doing? Good. That's what I'm talking about. Great. Um, well, I am sharing this morning's message with my guy, John Pendre, this morning. So super excited about that. We're going to do a little tag team here. We've never done this before. It was uh, John's idea, which I absolutely loved. And so uh, the title of today's message or, or where we're going to be uh, in first off is Isaiah 40. We're going to look at the entire chapter, actually, and we're going to draw some things from it. Uh, and the title is The Infinite and Intimate Worship, The Infinite and Intimate Worship and the Link Between Personal and Universal Praise. So why don't we, uh, before I read the scripture here, let's just pray here, please. Father, we give you our, our full attention right now, our full focus, and uh, God, we ask that you would come and speak to us right now, Lord. We pray for revelation in your word, Lord. We thank you that you have given us your word, but we are dependent on you, Holy Spirit, to bring revelation to us in such a way that grips our hearts and helps us to uh, live in such a way that's different. So God, come and speak to us, Lord. Speak through us. I do pray that you'd anoint John and I as we bring your word. May it be relevant and applicable to all of us right where we are right now, Father. So, Lord, just come and convict us and counsel us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, I want to read all of Isaiah fo uh, chapter 40. So if you just um, uh, bear with me here, it'll be up top here as well. Uh, we'll go through it and then we'll, we'll talk about some things that we want to pull out from this. Comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the wilderness a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all mankind together will see it, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, because the breath of the Lord blows on them. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. You who bring good tidings to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring tidings to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. Lift it up and do not be afraid. Say to the towns of uh, Judah, here is your God. See, the sovereign Lord comes with power and his arm rules for him. See, his reward is with him and his recompense accompanies him. He tends his flock like a shepherd. He gathers the lambs in his arms and carries them close to his heart. He tenderly, or sorry, he gently leads those who have young. Who, have, who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breath of his hand marked out the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on scales and hills in a balance? Who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely the nations are like a drop in the bucket. They are regarded as dust on the scales. He weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Lebanon is not sufficient for altar fires, nor its animals enough for burnt offerings. Before him, all the nations are as nothing. They are regarded by him as worthless and less than nothing. To whom then will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? As for an idol, a craftsman crafts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and fashions silver chains for it. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol uh, that people that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told from, to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. 
He brings princes to naught and and reduces rulers of this world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither. And a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the starry hosts one by one and calls them each by name because of his great power and mighty strength. Not one of them is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That is awesome. (laughs) That is a pretty awesome passage of scripture, isn't it? We titled today The Infinite and Intimate Worship, the link between personal and universal praise, because within Isaiah 40, we believe that you see both of these things happening, the awe and wonder and majesty of who God is and what he's done, but then also the God who will draw near to us as well, the God who cares for us, the God who uh, renews our strength. And we were thinking about how this is, it's so important to have both, that the praising of God should enlarge our perspective and give us increased revelation of who God is and what he's done, what he's doing and what he does for us. That personal praise and universal praise, they work together in our lives and we have to have a proper balance of both. That potentially focusing on personal praise, we might become too nearsighted in our view of God, looking in and missing the importance of looking out. Just that phrase of losing sight of the forest through the trees. And the other side, the flip side, focusing mainly on the on universal praise, we can maybe miss the importance of Jesus as our Savior, our shepherd, and the one who wants to walk close with us in this life. Both strengthen one another. One is not superior to the other, but they feed off of one another. We love the friendship of God, but we must also love the supremacy of God, the otherness, the wonder, the mystery of God that is infinite and intimate worship. John Piper said it like this, God meets us in high and holy ways. He meets us in lowly and meek ways. He meets us in thunderously glorious ways. He meets us in quiet, intimate ways. He meets us in complex ways and simple ways, furious ways and merciful ways. It's great, isn't it? So what I'm going to focus on, and then John is going to focus on the other side, I'm going to focus on what we're calling infinite worship or this universal praise. And what I mean by that is the aspect of this chapter is talking about God being the creator, the powerful ruler, the all-knowing, self-sufficient God, the sovereign one. The awesome one, if you will. <laughs> uh, one, of the, one of the things that we do on the school of worship, you guys are all getting a little taste, I suppose, today who uh, have not done the school. Um, as we go through a book called uh, Exploring Worship with a, a man uh, who wrote the book named Bob Sorge, and one of the things that we do is, um, you know, we, we end up memorizing many of his quotes because they're such helpful quotes uh, in understanding praise and worship and many facets of it. And one of his quotes that I love that I think just ties into this so well is, praise is not contingent upon our feelings. It's based upon God's greatness and that never changes you know it's one of those things that just stabilizes us immediately that gets our eyes off of ourselves especially when we're going through difficult things or especially when we're just confused or frustrated with why we're going through difficult things right you know which again I think Isaiah 40 does such a great job in this but it's saying it's not contingent on our feelings 
It's completely contingent on understanding who God is, his goodness, his greatness, and that never changes. I love that quote. It's one of those that uh, we always see to solidify our students on the school quickly, and then you see God just build on that fantastic foundation. What we see in uh, Isaiah 40, definitely throughout the book of Isaiah for what it's worth, uh, and definitely in the book of Job, maybe those of you that know the book of Job, you probably see very similar dialogue or language here uh, from Isaiah 40 as you uh, would see in in Job. And uh, when God addresses man in the midst of trials, uh, in the midst of maybe confusion, especially when man is complaining... (laughs) We'll just keep that general for now. I'm not saying you complain. Um... You know, what he does is he enlarges our perspective, not merely by answering temporal questions that we have. (laughs) In man's ignorance and pride, he demands answers. In God's wisdom and grace, he provides perspective. We'll be wise to accept what he says and praise him in the mystery and wonder of his vast, unmatched nature. I believe the beauty of focusing on the attributes of God or who he is and what he's done is that through them, a hundred questions get answered and a hundred weights get lifted because we find the real answer is in his presence. I know when I go through difficult things, when I feel frustrated or confused and these kinds of things, which we always will in this life on this side of heaven, I find what God does is he brings me perspective in things. And sometimes that's the telling off of of me. (laughs) Sometimes it's a rebuke. Sometimes it's God going, where were you when I did this? Or do you know who you're talking to? I did this and I did this. I am this. And then what happens is we're filled with awe. And it's not to say that God does those things because he's mad at us. That's not the case at all. And John's going to talk about how God draws near to us. But it's to help us understand and have perspective and for us to draw near to his presence. And as we do, guys, we find all the answers were found in knowing him and acknowledging him and the power and grace of who he actually is. Another aspect to this is that mystery fuels worship. It doesn't confuse it. Worship is the ultimate expression of humility. It is the exalting of God as who he is and acknowledging his supremacy. (laughs) In verses 13 and 14, I love these because it just talks about him owing us nothing. You know what I mean? He's just I owe you nothing. <laughs> He's given us everything, right? But it's this interesting dialogue almost. Like he owes us nothing. He owes us no answers. And if he was to really answer us, we wouldn't understand it anyway. Because his ways are so beyond our ways and his paths beyond tracing out. We are like grasshoppers. That's what Isaiah called us, right? We're these insignificant things and... <laughs> In that sense, he owes us nothing. And we'll be wise to respond in absolute humility and exalting him. But let me stay on this for a minute. Let me stay on this aspect of mystery and worship. I want to read a a quote by worship leader Matt Redman. He's written many just fantastic songs throughout the years. And he says some just outstanding things on, uh, on awe and wonder in worship. He says this, worship thrives on wonder. We can admire, appreciate, and even perhaps adore someone without a sense of wonder. But we cannot worship without wonder. For worship to be worship, it must contain something of the otherness of God. So often paradox is the gateway to mystery and wonder in worship. There are so many paradoxes found in the truths of Scripture, and each of these beautiful tensions is an essential ingredient for mysterious worship. Guys, worship thrives in wonder. I believe what we see in this Isaiah passage is worship thriving in wonder. I believe we need to keep wonder in our daily routine. I believe we need to step outside and look at the sky. I believe we need to go to places that fill us with awe and wonder from what God's created. I believe we need to go to the ocean. We need to go to mountains. We need to go to valleys and canyons and all these things, you guys. We need to slow down and take in the beauty of this amazing creation that God's filled us with. I'll I'll share a really quick uh, 
kind of funny story with you. <laughs> so I was, my, my family and I were visiting the Biggers up in uh, northern Michigan this past week. It's wonderful. And one of the things that we did is we took this, um, uh, um, like, tubing trip down this, this uh, river in the middle of absolute nowhere. I think it's called the Platte River. It's just absolutely beautiful. You're in northern Michigan. It just doesn't get better than this. A beautiful day. And we're just kind of like a natural lazy river, right? We're just all cruising down this thing. And at one point, uh, you know, our families are kind of together. And at one point, you know, there's this lady, uh, we're on tubes, but there's this lady and her, her daughter on a kayak. And they are just like whipping through this thing. <laughs> and uh, this bald eagle comes up. But it's, and we're like looking at, we're like, oh, there's a bald eagle. We're just like freaking out over this thing. And this lady and her daughter are coming this way. And the daughter's like, I don't know, seven, eight. So I'm like, well, surely she would want her to see this bald eagle. So I kind of go, hey, there's, there's a bald eagle. And this lady's just like, just kind of flying right through. And Gary starts laughing at me like, okay, well, that was awkward. But, and I think it's a picture of how we are sometimes. Like there's things that God's trying to show us and get us to get our attention of the beauty and wonder. And these people, I don't know where they're trying to go. I don't really know. She seemed mad. The daughter seemed disappointed. So I don't know. Maybe the, the mom was going somewhere and the daughter was not happy. But I'm like, well, eh, bald eagle, whatever. Not a big deal, apparently. There's this beautiful thing. We've got to take these things in, you guys. I believe that so much of the awe and wonder of knowing God is right there in front of us. And I think it will enlarge our perspective and help us uh, in our daily routine. I just think it's so huge. Uh, and just a couple of final thoughts here before I pass it over to John. Verse 6 and 9 um, what we see is the action, the, the expression, the, the command, if you will, uh, really the outworking of what praise looks like. What does he say? Cry out, lift up your voice with a shout, you know? So the, the two answers in there are simply saying, listen, all men are like grass and their glory is like the flowers of the field. It's all going to drop. It's like nothing. But what is eternal? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord is eternal. And the other one just simply saying, say this, say this is our God, you know? And it's just this aspect of praising God and acknowledging who he is, you guys. It's so huge, isn't it? Praise is the appropriate response in that sense. Uh, Bob Sorge says it like this, again, from uh, Exploring Worship. Praise is being preoccupied with who God is and what he's done. What's not in that statement is us. Is us. It's not about us. It's all about him. Praise is this one-way street of just acknowledging who God is, being preoccupied with who God is and what he's done. We're always preoccupied with what's going on in our lives, right, so often. And the challenges or the things, whatever, the things that are in front of us. And praise isn't that. And that's what we find in this. It's like, listen, guys, we're these very temporal things. But what's not temporal is us declaring the wonders of God, trusting who he is, speaking out his word. One of the things I do is um, I follow uh, uh, NASA on Instagram. <laughs> Because I love it because it just, uh, it's one of those things that can come up in my phone quickly and I just go, oh, that is awesome. That helps me understand how little I really am, you know, as these guys discover more stars, discover more galaxies, you know, all these kinds of things, which obviously God is creating and has created, um, but we're discovering these things and it just fills me afresh with awe and wonder. Let me just read a, uh, a beautiful, beautiful uh, hymn written in 1901. Some of you might know it. I just want to read it, and I'll close with this. It's a hymn called, This Is My Father's World. It says, This is my Father's world, and to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my Father's world. I rest me in the thought of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, his hand, the wonders wrought. This is my father's world, the birds their carols raise, the morning light, the lily white declare their maker's praise. This is my father's world, he shines in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass, he speaks to me everywhere. 
This is my father's world. Oh, let me never forget that though the wrong seems oh so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied and earth and heaven be one. All right. What a great hymn. Okay. Well, it's great to see everyone. It's been a while since uh, since I've been here, uh, about a month. We have a uh, reason for that. I would say a very beautiful reason for that. And here she is, Faith Abigail Pendre, uh, born July 7th. Yeah. So we are loving having a baby girl. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, we have three boys and we finally uh, got our girl. And I've had a number of people ask me, you know, oh, is it so different having a girl? And the answer is at this age, no, it's pretty much the same. There's, there's really two differences, one of which is diaper changing. Uh, that's a little different. And the other thing is bows. So we've never done that before, but we have uh, a lot of bows that apparently we need to put on her head. So, <laughs> so we got given a lot of bows, got a lot of hand-me-down bows. And uh, you know, I think at a certain point, it's like, wow, we've kind of accumulated about 100 bows here. Like, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> So anyway, I was talking to Kim one day, and this was before Faith was born. She was like, John, I just think we need a few more bows. And I thought she was joking, so I was like, totally agree. Yeah, let's get some more jesting back. And she was like, oh, good, I'm so glad. Let me show you my car to the shopping car. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. I thought we were joking here. We, we seriously need, okay, more bows. So that is the, the difference with a girl. All that to say that it's uh, great to be back, uh, excited to open the scriptures together. So, um, so I love this quote that Cal highlighted, praise is preoccupied with who God is and, and what he's done. Cal told me that quote back in 2009 and had me memorize it. And uh, it really changed my life. It was so helpful for me because uh, I loved God and I praised God. Uh, but a lot of times I was preoccupied with uh, my own feelings. Uh, so I go into a, a praise and worship time and kind of assess how I felt at the beginning of it, see whether it was different at the end of it. Uh, and that would kind of be my uh, judge of was this a good worship time or did I praise right or, you know, all these kind of things. It was, yeah, I was preoccupied. <laughs> you guys are like, you were narcissistic by then. I, pro I probably was. Uh, but this was kind of how I was. I was preoccupied with my feelings and how I'm doing. And so this quote was just so helpful for me to realize, okay, when I get into a worship time, this is just an act exercise in forgetting myself, putting my feelings aside, and just totally focusing on the praise that God uh, is due and the worship that I can give him. And that's really, really a great pattern for our lives. If we can kind of develop that muscle then in the workplace or in family life of, okay, in this moment, again, I'm going to put my feelings aside and think about what praise and worship is God do right now from my life? That's a great thought process, isn't it? So anyway, all that to say, though, praise uh, is, you know, a lot of times it's not inherently intimate. There is this kind of sense of I'm leaving myself behind. I'm just focusing uh, on God. You know, I could go out for a meal uh, and say, wow, this, this meal was delicious. The, the chef is so great. And I'm praising the chef. And you might say, oh, you really love the chef. No, I've never met him. There's no intimacy here at all. It's just, it's just praise of him. Uh, and Jesus said, didn't he, that even the rocks could cry out and praise me? And again, there's no intimacy there. It's genuine praise, but there's not, not a heart connection. They're rocks. Uh, and so praise isn't inherently intimate. There's this kind of, uh, as Cal said, there's a turning our eyes out to something bigger than us. But praise... Uh, definitely can be intimate too, and it especially can lead to a, a place of, of great intimacy. Uh, and the end of this chapter, chapter 40, Isaiah just gives us a great model for how that can look and how that can work out. And so that's what I want to do is just look at these last few verses uh, step by step. So jumping in in verse 27, it says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? 
And so we've had all this praise of God, all this talk of his greatness and his majesty. And this verse kind of brings us crashing back down to earth, right? It's kind of this personal moment. And it's really a moment of disconnect between, okay, I really believe these things about God. Uh, I'm, I'm praising him for them. And yet there's such a disconnect then between what's going on in my life and the things that I'm walking through. If God is this powerful uh, the why am I not seeing his power in, in my life? You know, the intended audience that Isaiah had for this chapter was the people of Judah who were in crisis. They've been taken into exile by the Babylonians. So at this point, they're victims of war. They're refugees. They've been displaced. Many of them would have lost loved ones in the conflict, all of these kind of things. And it makes sense that they have this heart cry of, do you see me, God? Is my way, to are we totally hidden from you now, God? Have you disregarded us? All this, all this praise of God is supposed to be comfort. That's the way that the chapter starts is comfort, comfort my people. And yet it can feel like the exact opposite of comfort. Because again, how do I reconcile all of God's power and greatness with the difficulties, the trials, uh, the sin and suffering uh, that I'm going through or that I'm seeing around me? And we can be in this kind of a place. And so verse 28 says this, it says, have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not grow faint or weary. His understanding is unsearchable. And this is nothing new. This is just a repeat, a recapitulation of what Isaiah has already said in this chapter. There's nothing new in that verse. So the point is this, Isaiah's instruction, just keep praising God. Just keep praising God. Don't let the magnitude of your trials trick you into thinking that God is small. Like if the things you're going through now, they seem really big and God seems really small. And this is a loss of perspective. And what you desperately need is praise. We need to come back to praise. We need to decide, I'm not going to let my view of God be determined by my circumstances. I'm going to let it be determined by the word of God. This is Isaiah's first instruction to them is insist on praise. Insist on praise. I think we've all experienced this. You know, we can come into a worship time, maybe weighed down with, with stress. Maybe we're thinking about the things coming up in the next week. Uh, we've got all these things on our mind and all of a sudden we start praising God. We just catch a glimpse of how big he is. And all of a sudden, why was I stressed? That makes no sense. When I was looking at my problems, it felt like it made quite a lot of sense. But now that I see God, it makes no sense. Or it could be something like this. Maybe we're coming into a worship time and we've just started to harbor some bitterness in our hearts about something and we feel quite justified in it. But then in a time of praise, we just, we see Christ again. We see the cross. And all of a sudden, how could I hold on to this offense? How could I do it? In light of the praise of God, seeing how good and loving he is. And so Isaiah's instruction again to us is just keep praising. That's his first instruction. But then there's this beautiful turn in verse 29. It says, God gives power to the faint and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Now, this is something new. This is something that we haven't seen in this chapter yet. We've heard all about how strong and how powerful God is, but now he's saying he's going to be strong for you. He's going to lend his strength to you. And this is where praise starts to get personal because in all of God's strength, all of his power, he doesn't just click his fingers and change our circumstance. He says, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to give my power to you so that we can walk together through the circumstance that you're going through. So for the Israelites, the message wasn't, hey, this exile is going to be over tomorrow. It was, I'm going to walk you through it every step of the way, which is so gracious of God. All of a sudden, praise gets more personal because the strength, the power of God isn't just something out there that we praise him for. It's something that we're beginning to experience in our own lives. I know he's strong because he's strengthening me to walk. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting talking to people who've been through uh, trials, maybe in intense 
uh, extraordinary trials. And if they've continued to praise God through that, if they've clung on to God, then what, what they say is something remarkably similar, which is, I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but actually I wouldn't change it. I wouldn't change it because in the trial, in the valley, I've come to know an intimacy with God that I never knew on the mountaintop. I've known him strengthening me in a way that is completely unique, and I actually wouldn't change it. That's the goodness of our God who, who comes to us to strengthen us. And it leads us finally to this place of, again, great strength and intimacy. Verses 30 and 31 say, Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted, but they who wait for the Lord... And this is really, I think, where the whole chapter has been aiming towards. They who wait for the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So now that we've praised God, now that we've insisted on praising God, now that we've held to that, we're able to do something that we could never do otherwise, which is just stop. I can just wait on the Lord. I can breathe. Before that, I was flapping around, trying to get everything sorted out, trying to fix everything that I could, as if it all depended on me. But now that I've seen God, I can just stop. I can just wait in his presence and know him. You know, waiting, I believe, shows above everything else that we trust God with our lives. It's kind of like tithing. Okay, we can, we can say that we trust God with our finances. We can feel like we trust God with our finances, but we actually do the action of trusting God by, I'm going to give you my first 10%. Well, it's the same with waiting on God. You know, I, I trust you. I say it. I declare it. But I actually show it by stopping. I'm not going to rush ahead and do everything that I think I need to do. I'm going to wait in the presence of God. And, God, and Isaiah gives us this beautiful image for what happens when we do that. He says, you'll rise up on wings like eagles. And you think, how do eagles fly? Cal knows because he was slow enough on the river. You don't see them flapping, right? It doesn't look like they're working hard. They just have their wings spread out, catching the wind and soaring through the sky. It looks effortless, and it is effortless because it's not their own work. It's not their own effort. It's being carried by a force outside of them. Amazing, isn't it? And that's what Isaiah is saying to us. That's what it's, it can be like in our lives that you're being carried every day by the breath of his spirit, not your own strength. It's him coming to us over and over again. So it's a really beautiful image with a, just a very practical instruction that we just praise God, we praise him until we see him, until we catch a glimpse of him. And then when we have, we just stop, we just wait. And not all at once, not, not in just a day, but as we do this over time, we become a kind of people who can soar through life with God. Amazing. So just on a personal note here, I really feel like God's been challenging me on this, speaking this to me afresh over the last few months. Um, you know, I, I kind of got to a point where in all of my um, activity, activity even before God, uh, God was just starting to show me that I'm missing this aspect of stillness, silence, just waiting before God. Uh, and he's been drawing me uh, back into that. And it's been just a thing that's been missing in my walk with God. It doesn't mean that I haven't loved God. It doesn't mean that I haven't known God. But there's, it's like there's this new, fresh intimacy that I'm having with God as I'm still in his presence. And, uh, you know, uh, kind of alongside of that, uh, some of you might know this because it's kind of been my hobby horse for a few months now. But um, I really started to feel like my phone was waging war against my intimacy with God. And so I started to wage war against my phone. And by the grace of God, I'm winning. And I gotta tell you guys, it's, it's yeah, I could talk about it for a long time. Um, and I have to many of you, so apologies. But honestly, it's been like a fresh breath of life in my relationship with God. I feel like I'm seeing him in so much of an intimate, uh, vibrant way than I have for a long time. Um, 
And so what I want to leave uh, us with is just a, an encouragement for this week. I want to invite you to try a practice with me this week. Uh, and this is what it is, is that when you wake up in the morning, before you turn your phone on, before you start to get sucked into the day, and, and we all need to live our days, and, and that, that's a good thing. But before we get going with it, I want to encourage you guys to take some minutes to praise God. Uh, you could just do it by reading through Isaiah 40. I can't think of a better way than that. But, but one way or another, praise God uh, personally. And then once you've done that, again, once you've seen him, just caught a glimpse of him, just wait. Spend a few minutes doing absolutely nothing. Just be still before God. And what might happen if you're anything like me is you'll just feel this pull. It's like your flesh starts screaming, I got to get something done. <laughs> And just resist that and stay in his presence. And I'm telling you guys, as we do this together, uh, I just believe that God's going to meet us in a, in a new way, in a fresh way. We're going to start to experience soaring on the breath of his presence. That sounds good, doesn't it? All right, let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for meeting with us even this morning. Thank you that you're so gracious to come to us, to come close to us, to reveal yourself to us. God, I pray that you would expand our vision. I pray that we see you in your bigness, in your infinite majesty. Help us to know you more and more. Uh, but God, as we do that, help us to draw close to you in intimacy and worship. God, help us to wait, strengthen us to wait before you. And God, we thank you so much that you come and draw close to us. Amen. Amen.